I'm always thrilled and flattered when people actually show up, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always a great, wonderful experience for me, and I'm always kind of reminded, I think every one who does a presentation or does something will talk about the time that there was no audience or this or that. And my grandson and I did a presentation in Middlebury about the 251 Club. We had the whole thing all put together. Unlike here at this library where they get everything all ready and get everything set up, the guy says, here's the key, you know. There's the equipment. Oh my God. So when we got there, uh, three people showed up. Two of them were his parents. <laughs> Somebody who still went through the same presentation, but I think every author, presenter has that experience where was anybody here? So I'm thrilled and flattered that you're here. And yes, I have been around, poking around our Vermont back roads for 70 some odd years. And uh, these are a couple of things that I like to talk about and thank the library and page for having me. And just a little bit of uh, with the covered bridges. At one time, there was over 700 covered bridges in the state of Vermont. Currently, there's about 100, 100 of them that remain that over the years, including we got two for trains and a haunted one. And um, I'll go on a little bit more of the demise of some of them a little bit later. But I grew up in Middlebury and the Pulp Mill Bridge. And a lot of times, these are near where there's uh, there's mills and bridges and mill towns and stuff, and there were activities. But growing up in Middlebury, it was interesting that um, as a kid, I would walk through there, and in a picture on the left side, as it was rebuilt in 2012 or something, put that walkway and something on it. But as a kid going through there in the 60s or early 70s, uh, with the traffic going both ways through there, it was a little bit of a challenge. You actually got in behind the post in the center and let the cars go whizzing by. Uh, it's also, they also had talked about it for years, they said it was built in uh, 1820 and they touted it as uh, one of the oldest bridges in the state, but that was never not true and now they kind of admit more to the year of 1853. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that was uh, my, one of my fond experiences of going to there all the time and probably getting into a little mischief there on occasion. The Windsor Cornice Bridge which spans uh, New Hampshire, or the, the uh, Connecticut River, and the boundary of, uh, hi there, you know, and the boundary to Vermont and New Hampshire. And it was the longest covered bridge <coughs> in the country. Uh, it was built in 1866. Uh, a few years ago in 2008, um, there was one built out in, in uh, Ohio, but it certainly doesn't look like anything of our nice New England traditional bridges. Um, it's interesting. Um, anybody know where the Vermont New Hampshire state line is? No. No. It's right on. It's on. It's on the Vermont border. All of the Connecticut River is in New Hampshire. That's why I asked that question. The border, the Vermont New Hampshire border, is on the on the Vermont side of the Connecticut River. Yeah, I guess I'm smart of us and let them have that and let them build that bridge in their state. <laughs> but I, I asked that question because a logical thing is, yeah, it's a center line or something else, you know. I think there's a, a parian rights, riparian rights, you know, with the water rights or something. But I always kind of find that interesting, you know, that uh, that state line is right on the, uh, Vermont, on the, the Vermont side of the, of the <laughs> river. What's that? Yeah, it's still here. It's over there. It's over, it's over by Windsor, Vermont, you know, and it connects Windsor and then Cornish, New Hampshire. Um, still intact. And then here's a couple that were built for trains, okay? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, they were pretty much being replaced by the 1950s, these train bridges. Uh, that's my grandsons and I on the right doing what we call the 251 Club. And um, that was in Shoreham, Vermont, and it's 109 feet long. Um, and let me see, that probably, let me, that operated till about, how long did those things operate? Um, yeah, uh, 19, yeah, 1951. But the Wilcott one has another story because that community did not want to lose that covered bridge, you know? And, Essentially what they did, um, and I've, I've also physically been here, 
is essentially what they did is they built a steel girder type bridge <laughs> after they picked the bridge up, put the real thing in there that's going to carry the trains and stuff and carry that traffic and set the aesthetic covered bridge back down on top of it. And that operated, I think, till 1991. Um, but it's just another way to, I mean, Vermonters are, 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 are like that. We'd like to hang on to our past. We restore things. Uh, any of you familiar that uh, up in Vermont, in Brookfield, Vermont, there's a floating bridge? <laughs> if you can imagine that, a floating bridge. It started out, I think, with farmers building it and stuff and, and whatever. And when you went across it, uh, like when it was, you know, it, it, it lasted till about 15 years ago and finally the engineering design said you can't do this anymore. But when you drove onto it, there would be hundreds, there'd be lots of people on it, swimming, diving, fishing, doing all kinds of things. And the bridge would settle down a little bit. It had about that much water on it when you went through it, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, my daughter was driving one time and going across through it. She kind of froze. She didn't want to drive any further. You're not supposed to drive across water, right? And that bridge would float and settle down. But even though it's not quite as rickety and boarded up as the old one, the state of Vermont built a new floating bridge there. It's a little more modern design and stuff like that. But we do those traditions in that. And that's what the, this, this train covered bridge is. And that's what the floating bridge is up there. What is the need to have it covered in this area? Uh, that's a, um, one of the questions that I'm going to ask a little bit later is why do they, ask so, why do they last so long? Because they're covered. Among other things, that sounds a little smart, but that's what it is. In other words, if you look at our 200, 200 plus year old homes that have lasted all this time, they were made of wood. They're replaceable and fixable piece by piece and piecemeal. So that's why they've lasted that long. And also the type of, the, I'll show you some other pictures of it, the type of design, the, the struts and structure that holds them together. But primarily, because it was wood and it's readily available to piecemeal repair them if it gets hit or damaged, um, maybe a fire here and there. But that's why. They, but they lasted so long because they were covered. You know. okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Most <laughs> and if, of the cedar shingles, or how, what kind of roofs do they have? Um, yeah, most. Yeah, mostly whatever the the, the 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 shingles would be. That not. I don't believe I ever saw them. You really can't see them. But, but I don't believe they ever had the metal roofs or the slate or some of those other things. You know, I think whatever material, probably some wood shingles in the early days for sure. And of course, shingles last 30, 40, 50 years when you get in the wood or something. So those would get replaced over time. But um, you know, so no, nothing that was any more permanent than that. And then up in Stowe, yeah, is Emily's Haunted Bridge. I have been there. And uh, tradition or folklore or story is that poor Emily was left stranded um, at, the, uh, at the altar when her would-be husband didn't show up, okay? And of course, she went off in a tizzy or this or that, and there's a couple other different versions of what happened to her. But anyway, I think she had a terrible accident and perished, you know, going through there. Um, and there are the actual paranormals, which is a term I don't quite understand. Why isn't it para-abnormal, you know? Why is it? There's nothing normal about that. But there are people, when they do those things, there have been people there with the film, the film stuff and stuff like that. They'll talk about cars getting scratched and this and that. You know, how much of that is uh, absolutely true, I don't really know. But anyway, uh, I've also been to that bridge and had some fun there, but no ghost arrived, you know. <laughs> The Hammond Bridge in Pittsfield, Vermont, um, built in 1842, 139 feet. As I said, all of these bridges had some story of, of, of note or whatever. And this one had a pretty interesting story. And this is that part I was talking about why they last so long because they're covered. And some other things will show you the design truss or something that makes that. And I just told you they didn't have metal roofs, but this one's got a metal <laughs> roof. Yeah. So there's our answer to that. As a matter of fact, I wonder how some of these newer ones or whatever probably would put the metal roofs on them or something. But uh, we had this um, flood in 1927, you know, that everyone talks about as a benchmark when something happened. And it wiped out, not to be returned, hundreds of these bridges, you know. In other words, at one time there were 700, now we're down to 100. So when it went through there, when the flood of 1927 went 
through there, it took the Hammond Bridge with it, intact, downstream, over a mile. Oh that bridge <laughs> stayed intact, but that flood that went through there, remember it's wood, you know, and ended up in a farmer's field. So what did those hardy Vermonters do? They drug it back up and put it back in place. <laughs> There's a couple of versions whether they, whether they floated it up or got the horses or whatever and brought it back up in place. Um, and I think that one, that one lasted, yeah, till, uh, actually operated until 1921. I guess, it, like I said, there's, there's a couple of other versions whether it was floated back up or whatever, but that's what resourceful Vermonters would do. It was perfectly fine. They just got it back up there and put it back where, where it started from. Yeah, 1920s, yeah, in other words, what it is, in 1927, it was built in 1842. And in 1927, when the flood came through here, like we had one I'm going to get to in a bit, a little bit, uh, in, in uh, Irene, that we had a few years ago, that created quite the same havoc. But anyway, so it wiped that out, and it was brought up in 1927 and operated for almost another seven years. Until, until it was replaced somewhere else with a more modern... It's still there. It's still there just as it looks like that. It's closed off. People are there, you know, to check it out. But yes, it, it, it would just be there and they would maintain it enough so that people could come and, and check it out and make sure the metal roof doesn't leak. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's still there and there's a new modern one somewhere nearby. But it went downstream. What? And then the Bartonsville Bridge over in Rockingham, over in Route 103. I'd pedal my bike through there. And this shows a little better effect of, this, of the truss work that holds them together and you know the, the bridge abutment and stuff like that. I've, I've pedaled through there my bike a few times. I bet you have two linemen. I bet you've pedaled through there a few times. You guys get out there but anyway uh, that's what that bridge looked like uh, you know I think uh, pre-Irene you know and that's a, a big tropical storm that everyone knows about that came through here and after Irene went through it looked more like this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it looked like that. Obviously, that one didn't float downstream. We're not going to retrieve that one. But there again, you know, I think uh, like I was talking about with that uh, floating bridge, and it comes time to do this, like the Wolcott uh, um, train bridge, they said, no, 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 not so fast. Don't just put a steel trestle type bridge in there. Let's put something in there that connects us to our tradition and our past. And I don't know how the salvage of picking went with that one, but uh, today it looks like this. And that was completed in 2013. Wow. You know. But if you'll notice, it's a, it's a duplicate. If you could go back, you know, in other words, with, the, with those same trusses, the pictures, the same width. I'm sure by now uh, the boards or something, you know, have done something like that. But uh, again, um, and that, that would happen. Uh, we're, we're, we want to hang on to that past. And, there was a covered bridge there, and we're going to have another one. We're going to replace it with one. That, you know, uh, maybe you know more about that. I, I, I guess I've seen some of those things when I did the research. Yeah, I have done that. Well, a woman was filming. Yeah. This. The bridge was the old bridge. Yeah. And it was during the, the Irene yeah. hurricane or whatever. And um, as she's filming it with, I don't know, what's iPhone, whatever, and all of a sudden it started to move and went down and into the river, she crumbled into the river. And I said, like she was probably yeah. more surprised than anybody. Yeah. And it became, it went viral yeah. on the internet all over the world. It was yeah. just astounding to see this, yeah. this thing. I mean, nobody's ever caught one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing with today's smartphones and all of that, all of the things that we're catching or something. Yeah, in my research and poking this around, I've seen that film. Just as you said, I think she screamed or something. She's, take, she's taking that thing and all of a sudden, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what she did because she's taken a picture of, of this 150-year-old uh, structure and all of a sudden, yeah, it's like that. Yeah. So. But anyway, that's what it looks like today. And I'm sure, well, not so much today, but... I'm sure the, it, it, it's gotten right. a little more weathered and stuff and looks a little more traditional. Roof. Yeah, and then that other metal <laughs> roof. Yeah. So what is the roof of choice? <laughs> Help me with that. <laughs> and an interesting thing, again, with our Vermonters and our way of doing things, look at the date on that bridge. That's 1969. 
long, long after the covered bridges, you know, had stopped being built and utilized and just, excuse me, being maintained and saved. But the town of Woodstock says, not again, not so fast. And they replaced that steel trestle bridge that was there. I don't have the before picture, but they were just so enamored with, you know, they do that and they built that with a little walkway and stuff. But they built in 1969 a covered bridge. Probably, for sure, the youngest, newest one in the state of Vermont, you know. Dave, how, how unusual is it for bridges to have a walkway like that? Well, that's what I mean by the new. If you, in the beginning when I was talking, yeah, that is new because I, growing up, I mean, I meant that. When we crossed that bridge and there was traffic coming, you dodged, you got yourself next to a post. So that is, that's, that's new. And the one that was in, down in Middlebury was done in 2013. So no, you just found your way across them. I, those are the only two that I'm aware of. You know. And like I said, the one, the pulp mill bridge was a two-laner, so it even, even made it a little more exciting. You know. um, who ever heard of a turkey drive? And what on earth could turkey drives have to do with covered bridges? We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> My grandfather was born in 1885. And we'll just go and say that he was a character, okay? <laughs> and he was forever telling us children, okay, that he drove turkeys all the way to the Boston market. You know, he told us that, you know. And we never believed him, you know, that couldn't possibly happen. You can't herd cats across a room. How are you going to? Mark Bushnell, who some of you know is a noted author, and he's forever, he's doing what I, what I do maybe in a little bit more sophisticated manner. Um, I like to, I like to um, say that uh, I'm neither a scholar nor a historian, you know, and I'm unencumbered by the facts. I just tell <laughs> stories. I think Mark is a little more, does a little more research and stuff. I do do the research or something. But anyway, this is a story that I read that he, he posts them all the time. I think, I can't think of the title of it. It's way back when or something. But he's writing the same types of things that I talk about. So the next thing you know, I'm reading Mark Bushnell's story about turkey drives, about driving turkeys to the Boston market. Yeah, so all these years, my grandfather was not telling the stories or whatever. But the question I have for you, when they drove those turkeys across the covered bridges, what happened? They went to roost. They went to roost because now all of a sudden it's dark. If you ever raised animals, chickens, they go out at light and they go in at dark. So next, you know, they have to lug them to get them across the bridge. They'd come in there, all of a sudden it's nightfall and they'd go to roost. You know. So that was a great story and my grandfather um, was not telling stories, which he did on occasion. Yeah, that's what I mean. And, what's left of them, but whatever it is. I mean, that's just the way that it was. It's the pioneers in the early days. You did what you had to do, the cattle or whatever. It would be the same thing, and I think, uh, as what, what Mark wrote or something, excuse me, she went along, more turkeys joined the flock. You know, you're halfway there, well, I'll join you, and I don't know how they did it, but it apparently occurred. Now we get to some New England stone walls. At one time, New England had 200, if you can imagine that. 246,000 miles of stone walls. That's a lot of stones. They're the relics and ruins of our agricultural past. Um, and if you look around here today, I think you've noticed that as you drive around, unless something dictated that the lawn went to the, to the road, uh, maybe water and sewer was put in or any type of construction was there, the remnants of those stone walls are beside, they're up and down Barnumville Road, the street that I live on. You go up Route 30, you know, up to Dorset, and unless there's lawn or something, you'll just see the stone walls that are there. They're just, they've been picked over, there's remnants of it, but unless, the, unless there was something that made them there, they're there. They're just everywhere. They're everywhere that you travel around. And, and, and here's a, you know, just a case of some other things that I'll expand on a little bit. Um, but they've also, over these years, these last 150 or 70 years, they've been repurposed a lot, you know. They've been where they were just so stones were out there, particularly the coveted flat stones, okay. When they were building all those, um, when Dorset, yeah, Dorset Bromley and Stratton was being 
developed and built, those field stone fireplace stones didn't come at the lumber yard. I'll expand a little bit more about some of us entrepreneurs that went out and picked a few stones here and there. Okay. <laughs> So in other words, that's when they're the relics and ruins and the covered ones. And everywhere that you go, you'll see, and that's what that opening is in there, whatever there was reason there. And I know what happens to this day. I know that some of my masonry friends or something, we're, we're outdoorsmen, we're hunters and fishermen or something, and they'll be out there and they'll be eyeballing a stone here or a stone there, and maybe they'll bring their pickup truck and snatch it the next time they're out. But, but anyway, this is, they're, they're there, they're here, and they're, they're just a, the relics and ruins of our agricultural past. Just um, a little bit of um, background on something. I won't go through 4.65 billion years, but it did take when you put that shovel in the ground or if you put the rotor tiller to fire something up, it took that rock 4.65 billion to get there to greet you. So while the earth was being formed or whatever, we can just go back to the last, to the last 10,000 years when the glacier carved out what is now, you know, Vermont. I mean, anybody ever been to Lake Willoughby? Will Lake Willoughby's up in the, yeah. That's a fascinating epic when you look down through there, whatever you've been in Mount Pisgah or anywhere else. But it's clear that that is just carved out. You know, it's just there are mountains on both sides and just a narrow lake that's just carved out just like that. Clearly, clearly what the, gla what the glacier did. And then after the, the, uh, that freezing area, the ice ages, then um, when the sun came and the fog lifted or whatever, it took a few thousand years to completely cover this land with all that vegetation and topsoil that was just laying around here for when the pioneers, I call that the European invasion, came here to New England, uh, the new New England, and all that rich topsoil was there for the use and the agricultural stuff. That's after they chopped all the trees and got them out of the way and some other things. And um, by the mid 1700s, where the development in New England started, you know, near Boston and the southern part of the stuff, but as they needed more land, I always still refer to it as they did, they migrated to the howling wilderness we now know, know as Vermont. And all this rich topsoil was there. And the interesting thing, as they would migrate from southern New, southern New England to Vermont, there weren't any real estate agents showing them where the good stuff is. So when you got your land plot or this or that, it might be in a swamp, it might be the side of a mountain. But anyway, they carved out an existence. And as you go out in these very remote places and all these things, those stone walls, the foundations, all those relics are there. But after they'd been doing that for about 50 years, then the topsoil kind of depleted and did that. And by doing that, it exposed the rocks. And it also created some other things by exposing the rocks. And that's why it continues today. The ice and everything can get down there and, um, and it keeps migrating up. This happens every day. If you, if, if you know any farmers to this day when they're out there farming, when they plow that field, they're going to go out there and pick rocks. They're going to go out there with different ways to do it. You'll just see it. They're just going to surface every single year. It's endless, you know. So. so this is just one of those really nice pictures of our, our picturesque uh, thing. I just love this picture where it goes out through there. As Ann knows, most everything that I talk about, Robert Frost has pitched in and gives me a few lines for. And I just love this, this line, what I was just talking about. Uh, never tell me that not one star of all that slipped from heaven at night and softly fall has been picked up with stones to build a wall. Um, anybody know what a stone boat is? What is it, Malcolm? Okay. Yeah, I, you kind of got the modern version of it. I remember when we used to take car hoods and flip them upside down. But what it is, it's just a crude sled that's just carved together any farmer's wood with whatever was laying out there, like Malcolm said, some planks and stuff like that. Because when they were building stone walls, and that's what we'll get to, the, in other words, what you will see, those poor guys would pick up a stone as whatever they could carry, usually about this hot, and pile it on there. Then over time, you know, with the oxen and the bigger stones and rocks, uh, it's a stone boat. But I just remember back when, 
we had farms back in the 60s and 70s or whatever, there would be an old car hood to get flipped upside down. It was used for other things, but that was our, that was the poor man's, ver the woodchuck version of a stone boat, you know. Was stone boats used with mar in the marble? No, uh, no, stone boats, no, what they are, it's a boat used to haul stones. And these are the stone walls to get. I wonder if they moved marble slabs and marble. No, not, not that I'm, that, that's, that's another entire okay. different, no, that's, that's fine, that's fine, that's, a, that's another whole topic we can spend a couple hours at. <laughs> so, but anyways, anything that gets those, now the farmer goes out there and before he finishes harrowing and, and his process to plant, he goes out there and picks rocks and stones, and if you go out and you look at the fields or something and look closely, you'll see a pile of rocks, it's usually a copse of trees or something growing up through them, but every year when they turn that soil over, they're going to go pick some rocks, you know. Um, David, yeah. Oh, that, you know, uh, thank you for that, Malcolm. Uh, this is this is not a lecture. <laughs> this is about telling stories. His grandfather was working with his son picking rocks. His grandson and his grandson said to his grandfather, "Where did all these rocks come from?" His grandfather said, "The glacier brought them." And the kid thought about it. He said, "Where is the glacier now?" <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to use that line, Malcolm. <laughs> Absolutely. They're just endless. Went back for more. Yeah. Uh, many of us get to hike out up here on the Equinox Preserve, and for me, it's just a great snapshot, you know, of what this was all about, and including a, a situation where you can see these rocks and something pictured over there. As I get off the trails and poke around, these areas that I'm talking about, they're almost football field sized, you know. There again, that person's going to pick a rock, bend over, lug it off the side, <laughs> throw it on a pile, and go get another one, you know, so they get that area cleared out. And then when you start another one, you know, they're, not, they're, they're, they're trying to economize how far they can lug it and move it and stuff like that. So, um, so those up on Equinox Preserve, and, and sometimes you get more remote, sometimes the stone walls are intact. And this shows a little bit of, uh, Robert Frost's version of something there is that doesn't love a wall that throws them, you know, tosses them out, boulders out into the sun. But I've gone up at Equinox and kind of gotten off the beaten path, and you can see very distinct patterns about football football size. So what is the test The what? You said pest house. Oh, I, oh, thank you. I got <laughs> flew right by that. Anybody know what a pest house is? <laughs> what is it, Kate? And how do you know this? <laughs> I know it because I hike with you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's where, when, when someone is ill, they send them off to the pest house um, until they either recover or they pass away. That's what, almost what we don't have now, but it's pestilence is what it's short for. Oh, wow. And that's why the reason I'm there is upon Equinox is that foundation is the pestilence house. And that was something that, you know, was back in the early, late 1800s, you know, early 1900s, whenever there was that disease going on, like we got COVID. I guess we couldn't put everybody out in the woods, although it probably would have been effective. And that's what it would do. They would take the, the family of the people who put them out there, and they'd bring them food once in a while. And once they were all doing that, they'd, they'd do that. But, and my research has taken me to at least three or four others throughout Vermont. But up on the Equinox Preserve, thanks for catching that up. There's that pest house that was there. It's pestilence. Well, don't tell Malcolm's wife about that because she might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a little cabin. It's not, it's not that little resort cabin out back. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been banished to the, to the woods. And there again, I'm talking. This is a, right up on Route 30, right up. Uh, this is uh, Billy or Billy Burns' property or whatever. And right all along Route 30, you see that. But that's just a case of what was once, um, you know, just that tossed wall, and then over time or something, it kind of got tidied up and this and that. It's that perfect height or whatever. And there it is, you know, 150 years later, just as intact. It, over the time, it got wider and wider. Wide. But, I, huh? Very wide. Yeah. But I know one of the things when I was in construction or something, and once in a while we got to put a, some fence post in or maybe a mailbox or this or that, if I looked around the neighborhood and I saw a wall like that, I got a piece of equipment. You know? Never mind trying to do it by hand, because they are just playing everywhere. I mean, and that's, that's where it is. So that's been there. 
been tossed upon, tossed upon, and then over time, as uh, the property got a little bit developed and there was a little less farming, it just got, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to haul all those stones off? It costs you a fortune. That's why so many of them are just left behind. People would come and kind of pick and take what they wanted. Uh, but there that is today, you know, just like, it, just like it evolved over the last 150 years. And getting back to that little bit of a story, I have one that I want to share with you about those entrepreneurial, you know that term, woodchuck, okay? <laughs> of uh, what we did as a cottage industry back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and we knew about all those stone walls and all those field stones and all those covered rocks. They didn't come in pallets like that. So uh, I think we would cash the unemployment check and that would buy the gas and the sandwiches and the beer and we'd ride around. We might have a deal with a mason here that knew what he was looking for. And uh, we would kind of be able to do that and supplement, you know, our, that's what cottage industries are, supplement your income. And uh, there's a, uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur in town whom I've told this story many times, I won't bother with his name now, uh, who I did a lot of projects for him, built him some showrooms and uh, did a ton of work for his, for his business. And one day he came to me and says, I got a camp up in uh, Southeast Corners, you know, uh, and it needs a lot of work. Would you come up and fix, you know, pull it together for me? That was his term. And I said, wow, you're going to give me a job out in the woods rebuilding a cabin? You betcha, I'm on board for that. <laughs> so anyway, with that, it's funny, as we drove up to it, I'm thinking that once I get further out, and keep looking, this power line, you know, like usually you know, when you get out on these class four roads, you get out there, the power stops somewhere. And this is about a mile and a half from the last bit of uh, civilization. And I see that power line. So, hmm, looks like I'm going to have electricity. And sure enough, here's this nice little cottage stuck out there in the corner. And we go over there and poke it over. And because this is a repeat customer that I've done tons and tons of work for, each trade person is, you know, whether I need an excavator or a plumber or an electrician, we're all connected. We all do that. And, you know, as I always like the way uh, Joe said it, just, David, just pull this together for me. And I would just pull that together tell them what was going on, meet once in a while, and make the day-to-day -day decisions. Well, that particular cabin up there was a perfect example of the stone walls that I've described. When it was near the cottage or the camp, they were intact, they were square, and the flat stones were on top of them. They, had not, they were untouched. Well, anyway, as um, Joe and Robert, uh, the, the mason that we picked, his wife worked uh, in one of Joe's stores, so we needed that new mason. So now I've got a couple of these guys up there from honors. <laughs> and we're talking, and they're just kind of little vaudaire. Maybe they're getting to know each other a little bit, back to their grade school days or something. And hey, I'm here to get some work done. So I figure we'll chat a little bit. And when I want to tend to business, I want to take a moment and talk about looking around here as a perfect example of the Stonewall history. Notice how they're intact here at the cottage, at the camp. If you look out here, this one's picked apart. That one's picked apart. There's really nothing over there. And about this time, the stonemason takes his hat off. <laughs> he looks down kind of sheepishly. Yeah, I picked a lot of stone out of here, but I won't take no more now I know you own it. <laughs> and to this day, that occurs, you know. In other words, it's, they're just there. They're just sitting around out there. Uh, and as I said, we're active hunters, fishermen, or whatever. You know that. They just eyeball that stone that fits there. If you've ever seen a stone chimney being built, field stone fireplace or something, they're real artists. They're real artists. It's amazing. You know, first of all, when you get on a job, this great big structure that's maybe over, over Browning or Stratton, and it's kind of just shielded to the weather. And there's one guy out there in the middle of that with a salamander that he just going, he's got on a t-shirt and he's built like this. If you're ever looking for the stonemason, that's the clue. That's, that's which one it is, okay? And it's interesting, they got all those stones laid out there, you know, and he's looking at the stones, he's looking at that chimney that's going up, you know, and he knows where each stone is going to fit. It's amazing to watch. And they're doing the same thing with some stone walls or something. I meant to stop and take a picture when I was biking down West Road the other day. A guy was building them. But, you know, here's a pile of stones over here. And I drive by a week later and there's a perfectly shaped stone wall. It's really, it's, it's really quite impressive, you know. Do you know the name 
seems deep, but yes, because it's he took students from Cambridge High School, went to Salem, crossed the border, and found himself in a great area, and through research realized this was a town that he's been ailing. Now Shay's Rebellion. Shay's Rebellion? Yes. Is Steve Butts's? Yeah. Yes. So I, I don't mean, but I mean, yes. I've gone back and forth with Steve a few times. I've tried to get, get him to take me up there someday. Well, what was interesting was he, was he taught kids proper excavation mm -hmm. and taught them, like, when you see the crumbled chimney, yeah. that crumbled chimneys fall a certain way, whereas your rock uh, basement line mm -hmm. is a different rock. That's right. And it was, it's absolutely fascinating. And the wonderful thing about that particular place is once that was abandoned, it was abandoned. Yeah. It's just off in the woods. Yeah. But just. Of Salem and what yeah. is there? Don't get. Yeah. Don't get the Sandgate. Yeah. Sandgate. Yeah. Salem. And um, so when, the, when they're doing that, excavating, no one else has been there. Yeah. It, it's like a 250 year. Yeah. This is this is the way it was laid out. But when I went to one of his talks, he talked about the role of stone. Yeah. Yeah. In determining the layout. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's another one of the programs. It's, it's a fascinating story, and I've been trying to catch up with Steve because it it, uh, it but but it, as you said. There was a whole, it was Shay's Rebellion, if you remember that, from the Revolutionary War and post that, and, and taken on some anti-government or something in any way. One thing led to another, and there was finally some uh, gunfire, and some people were killed or wounded. And his followers ran up into the hills of Sandgate, Vermont, and built an entire community there with mills and found, uh, all these things. And with his group and those, those uh, eighth graders from over, in, they've done the archaeological digs and they've been finding all those things. I think there's 13 foundations over there. I've been trying to say, look, let me, <laughs> let me, t let me be one of the kids next time you go up there. Let me tag along or something. It's, it's fascinating. But it's all those stories. And I think for all of us that, that my friends that like with Kate and I, we get poking around the woods or anyone who has that experience, is if you see stone walls, you start poking around some more, you'll probably find some foundations, uh, eventually maybe some apple trees or whatever, and you just, no matter how remote it is, a lot of places in Vermont um, where the, the Mount Tabor uh, Cemetery is, there's one down in Bennington that I go to or whatever, where there's as many as 25 or 30 grave sites there, everything else has vanished. There's no community. There had to have been a community there probably doing charcoal, logging industry or something. But now it's just a remote place off into the woods, you know, that was abandoned, you know, a hundred years ago. And but there are gravestone and gravestone markers and foundations, you know. So. David, am I correct in the stone wall that provides two pieces of property as community property. You can't help yourself with stones unless your neighbor agrees. <laughs> Border between the two properties. I just happen to know because I have a little wind soap and a mason, probably a friend of yours. Jerry picked all the nice flat stones, yes. the border stone wall. Yeah. And, uh, we decided that was not really appropriate. We wanted them back. And yeah. a week later, there was a dump truck where the bowling balls dumped out on the ground where the stone wall had been. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, as I said, the coveted one, the field stone ones, you know. The nice flat ones, you know, they make the, yeah, in other words, uh, yeah, I know uh, one of my, I uh, um, can't think of the guy's name, but one of the authors wrote a great Vermont story. And he talked about, as we went back and forth like we're doing now, about where he took down a barn, you know, and of course there was that nice foundation and all those stones, he built himself a nice stone wall. So yeah, they're quite coveted and you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, he, he returned your stones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When um, some of you, uh, anyway, um, out behind where I live, out on Barnumville Road, up on what is called um, Beach Ridge, um, Brown's Meadow and stuff, there was a uh, manure up there, a family, you know, 
and this is just where there's just nothing but camps and stuff like that. And I lived there on Barnumville Road, and I would see dump trucks of those stones going out every day. It's pretty well picked clean, you know. So, but that's a shame because, as as I as I've told other people this, when you're doing that and they talk about seeing the stone of this that, and and Malcolm, you're right. I said that is someone's property. When you go out in somebody's property and pick their berries, that's their property. You might not do it in the front yard, <laughs> you know, but off in the woods, that really is somebody else's property, you know. So, and over time, as those tossed walls, you know, um, and, I, and I can get this to probably um, our prosperity that maybe begin to emerge around maybe 1850 here in the United, here in Vermont, when we started building those uh, nice uh, Greek revivals and the meeting houses and the townhouses. And I think that was when they decided that Pila, that tossed stone wall could really be something if I put some effort into it. And uh, I like to think the one on the, on the right is one that has been around forever, the way it's sloped and shaped or something. But what it would have, they would just would have taken the stuff that was there and tied it up and cleaned it up like I showed you that other stone wall. And then there's one, the one on the left. Um, what's different about that one that's probably different than the one on the right? Now, as we're talking, talking about landscape walls, Kate? Yeah, well, from here it looks like, yeah, one is more, a little more concave in the center, and the other one's flat. Yeah, that's one thing, and that's certainly how that was built and stuff like that. But if you look that down, and I'll show you another picture of the one, the one that uh, you helped me take a picture of in a minute. Um, no, no, it's just a, just regular stone and stuff, but it would just be in a landscape and stone. But the one on the left, okay, weaves in and out of the trees. It's up on the north road. It was built a few years ago. And you, so in other words, that was built only four or five years ago. Again, finding that stone and doing all that type of stuff. And I'll do that sometimes when I drive, pedal my bike up on, uh, on both, the, both the west roads, the Dorset west road, the Manchester west road. And you'll see lots of landscape walls, you know, that started out, you know, in kind of a rough shape or some crude shape or something. And um, so anyway, it's just, it's that. But that's certainly the one on the right is, is, is more of that traditional one. It was back to that and it just got picked and tidied up as we started doing some landscaping, you know. Hilding, this is down on River Road. Another, one of the things when you're, as you guys know, when you ride a bike, you see a lot more things when you're going 10 miles an hour instead of 50. And you notice these things. In Hildeen, as Robert Todd Lincoln's uh, estate, uh, with several hundred acres of land and the nice mansion and stuff up on there, but down on River Road has been the process for years. It used to be an event center where they did some things. And recent years, they decided they want to go back to its agricultural purposes or something. And I know one time, about four or five years ago, if you look more to the wall on the left, that was just overgrown and tangled up with snarl stuff. And there were crews of people, a couple, two, three guys every day, just getting those cleaned up. But I think what I'm getting at when this picture is a clear thing about a farm wall and a tossed wall and a state wall. We're on the same piece of property. And the one picture on the left has been that's where, the, that's where the mansion is. It's a long ways away. It's up on the hill. But where the cows were is the one that was on the left. You know. So in other words, I'm sure as they clean that up, this really turns into more of a rubble of stone. But uh, when it was on the mansion side at some time or other, they made that into an appropriate landscape wall. You know. And probably... This is another one of those, uh, one of my, the, the rail trail. We got a nice new ra uh, rail trail that is just, uh, I just love it there. It's a, it's a great thing. I, we hike it and bike it all the time. And actually Robin, um, who's probably going to post this picture with a little kiosk sign for me, uh, I wanted to go in there and dig that tarp out of there, but I guess he photoshopped it out for me. Not in this picture or something. But this is uh, when you get down on the, the northern end, um, in other words, that wall comes down on the right hand down over hill, you know, and it goes through there. 
and I just, I just always stop and look at it because just, I just so much enjoy that picture. But there's a clear case of that's a corridor. There are condos in there. There's townhouses. Um, you know, some, you know, the, but the trees do not, you know, they'll fall down and topple it and do some other things. But that wall, it's been picked over, a little rubbish and debris or something. But there it is, particularly as you get further away from where the rail trail is, you see the stones off in the distance are far more intact. Yeah, so. But anyway, each time we stop by there, I have to give a history lesson, you know, someone who's hanging around long enough and point those things out. But I, that's just a, a fantastic example of that. And then we got the 21st century. You know, we use stones to this day. That's up at Burn Burton. You know, there's an athletic field. Uh, up behind the, the, the school, up where the, that new living center is. It's where you turn in, it's where the parking lot is with all the kids and stuff. But, there's, but there is, obviously during, during different construction over the years, they didn't build all these other walls or something, they just piled up stones, they used that to cut that back. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see how that grade is gonna come down to the lowest grade where that athletic field is. So that field was dropped down and carved out of there. And you can be rest assured that pile of rubble of stones on the left was just stuff they put over there to kind of to, to, to support the roadway that goes in there. And then uh, obviously an excavator or a loader can pick up bigger stones and raise them higher. So in other words, but that's what, you know, that's, that was probably done eight or ten years ago. Yeah. So that's pretty much what I have got to say. Yeah.